Right, thank you very much. So, yeah, I'm from Waimati, so we're, um, we're pretty lucky. There's a map if you don't know where Waimati is. Um, so we're pretty lucky. We've been kind of an epicenter of growth for a lot of collar farms. So we've got about 70,000 collars, all flex collars on cows around our region, which gives us this awesome data set to play with. And, um, and so we've got some really cool benchmarking you know, to analyze some data and make some really cool tools out of the data. So what I want to go over today is, I guess, getting, first of all, it's just some background because a lot of people have this idea that if you put collars on, they're going to be this silver bullet that's going to solve everything. I just want to phrase and get people in the right mindset before we get too excited about them. Then we're going to look at what you can do around transition, pre-made heads, mating and mating reviews, and with a real focus on the actual data coming out of the Southern Dairy Hub. So, first of all, in some of that background, you know, what does a collar do? I guess, essentially, it's got three main functions. It's going to tell you if a cow's on heat, tell you if a cow's sick, and then get some rumination data, which you can kind of use to interpret that, you know, they're eating well, they're not eating enough, etc. Why are farmers getting into the collars? I guess, I mean, the biggest one we hear is things like, you know, they want to shoot themselves after standing on the stand for six weeks at mating. Um, staffing, um, some of these corporate farms or off-site management wanting a bit more oversight because their neighbours got it. Um, heat and health is a really big driver. Um, but the one that excites me the most is the, is the people who get in it, the farm management changes. How can we optimise our system? What can we do with that data? And I guess this is, this is where I really want people to think about it. before you dive in or if you're using it, are you this person? I guess successful collar users that we see, they have a really engaged farm owner team and management team. So, you know, you, if you've got a really engaged owner but the, the farm management team doesn't want to have anything to do with it, you're not going to make change and so on. You've got to buy in and trust the data. We see um, this natural thing, and I think it's just natural human emotion. The thing on the right there, the belief that every farmer believes in the top 10%, um, we see it quite often. And the collars are going to challenge that strongly. So they're going to say that some of the things that you're doing on farm are great, some of those things really need changing. And buying and trusting and believing that data, we find often takes a year to, to realise that it's, the collars are correct. Um, you need to be willing to put time into the data management, um, crack data in, crack data out. And I guess the big one at the bottom is that willingness to change farm management. If the collars tell you that something's not working, will you make those changes? Because that's where the real value in them is. Real quick rundown on making the budget work. So this is this is what I call the bare minimum. This is if you pretty much do nothing with the data, if you're going to get this. So about 50% of the collars will probably be paid for by dropping bulls out of the system, tail paint and all that kind of stuff. If you then did stuff like short gestation and game days and milk, it's you know, big games on top of that. With health, if you stopped one in 10 alertable death, you'd probably save another 20%. So obviously the more effort you put in, the better. Uh, with mating, if your mating, if your heat detection was perfect, we only picked up um, some, uh, what we call low heat, heat index score or you know, really you know, silent heats we'd probably pick up another 15%. If your heat detection is terrible, you pick up heats. Um, and then if you're getting one kg of milk from just slightly better management, you get the rest. So, you know, it's really easy to break even on these things, but it's all in your destiny and all in your hands on whether you make a profit on them or make a big profit on them, I guess. So, that's my soapbox bit. Now onto the fun bit. Um, so transition rumination, I guess, is one of the big, what I perceive as one of the big opportunities, and I think one of the areas where we don't perform well, or the collars are definitely saying, on average, we don't perform well. Um, so this is a graph that we produced a few years ago, um, just looking at what's the rumination recovery. So essentially you've got cows, they calve, they're going to drop in rumination on the day of calving, how quickly do they recover in that rumination rate post-carving? And in this data set, we were, we were quite fortunate to have 
a few different systems. So we did one today, colostrum management, like the Southern Dairy Cup's doing, which was the grey line, and a really good cool recovery line, great recovery. We had some farms doing the twice a day colostrums, so that was the blue line, and this is the farm. Quite a slow recovery, and really took a while to pick up. And then we had this great learning farm, who I presented at the side a couple of years ago, um, who had well, he believed in the once a day system, he'd been to Sue Mackey's course and he was um, you know, a big believer, but he was also a sheep milker and at day two, three, four, five, he dropped him into the vet to get some milk, milk check. And what it caused was this massive rumination variation as they dropped into the twice a day mob, they crashed off their rumination platforms. And so we got this huge variation in rumination across that transition zone. When we looked at that orange farm just for early carbon cows, um, if we looked at the total rumination minutes over the first seven days, there was a 10% spread in the six week and calf rate from the top performers to the bottom performers. Um, kind of a very similar split to the body condition score advantage. We then looked more at um, more data sets over the next couple of years, and one of the key findings that we found was. Um, feeding post-carving in terms of how quickly you recover is really important, but one of the key drivers in terms of where you started, you know, where was on the day of carving, how low did you go? Did you drop to 300 minutes or did you drop to 100 minutes? Well, was quite a lot determined by your spring of feeding, and spring of feeding was this massive opportunity, um, which I'll get to a bit in a minute, second. I guess in terms of the science, why does it matter? Um, I mean, this is, there's, you know, oodles and oodles of paper out there, but if you get transition wrong, it's going to increase your body condition score loss post-carving, increase your endometritis rates, affect your oocyte quality, which will affect your first round conception rates, um, decrease your cycling rates, increase mastitis, increase lameness from the fat pad loss, uh, more metabolic issues, and drop your peak production. So, you know, getting, getting transition right is probably reasonably important. So, how is Southern Dairy Hub tracking? So, this was kind of um, premise. Um, this, this graph here, how it works is, um, pointer. Uh, see the four colours, we've got the green, yellow, orange and red. And all the graphs that I show from here on, those are the quartiles of actual performance of herbs in our practice um, over the past few seasons. So if you're in the green, you're in the top 25% of performers. If you're in the red, you're in the bottom 25%. And I guess two things on why we presented it this way. One is we don't have validated research-based targets yet, um, but we do have really cool targets on what real farmers are achieving in that community. And so we know our best farmers can stay in the green, so they can hit, say, 450 minutes plus in their spring rumination. They can drop to around, I think, from memory, about 330, 340 minutes on day zero, so the day of carbon, and basically recover to 450 plus um, in the colostrum, which is day one to four, and early lactation, which is eight to ten. So that's a really good achievable, strong recovery rate. I guess Southern Dairy Hub, this is last year's data first. So we're going really well with um, spring rumination, 450 minutes, and when we cross-checked um, the diet, we, we're hitting over 90% energy, so it's looking really good. However, on the day of carbon, we're up to 313, then there are really slow recovery, so by day 10, we're still only at 417 minutes. Um, and we'll get to some of the body condition things before. Now, when we were talking to the staff team, we were talking about, you know, are you using your health alerts? What are you doing with them? And they said, no, we turned them off because we were getting, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 cows a day turning up in the health alerts, which is this thing here. So, um, essentially, they're in the red zone for all health alerts. So, Around 81% of all the heifers had a health alert in the first 14 days post carbon and almost half of the, the rest of the herd. And we often use the, the collar health events as a really good proxy for how good your 
transition was going. If they're low and at a manageable level and worth, you know, worth drafting and dealing with, your transition is probably going good. As soon as they're really high, you know, what it's really saying is that your transition's not optimised, which is showing in the fact that we're in this red zone. What's it done this year? Um, very similar, so almost exactly the same. So um, while we probably dropped some bait into silage over the system, um, some of the things, um, we'll talk about what we probably think some of those issues are, haven't changed this year. Um, and in fact, our health alerts have gone up. And then the question is, has the wind tree made any difference on this transition? So the fodder beak versus the baleage group. And understanding is, um, we see that the fodder beak have come off fodder beak a month before, but no, virtually, I mean, in fact, the colostrum and early lactation knobs are exactly the same. The baleage knob is three minutes a day low on day zero, and there is a slight difference in uh, spring and rumination rate, but interest in the baggage is lower, which is probably the opposite of what you would have predicted, but it won't be statistically different. Um, but yeah, no difference across those two groups. Um, and I guess going back to that health alert thing, um, so now in practice we get our farmers set up with a health alert decision tree, because what we find is the health alerts are great, and I mean these collars are amazing at picking up sick cows. And the issue that they are is that they will pick up, say, you know, even quite detectable diseases like metritis one or two days earlier than we typically would as humans, even with really intense monitoring. So you pull out a bunch of health, um, you know, health alert cows, and you're like, there's nothing wrong with these, these you know, these bloody collars, you can let them go and never do anything about them. So we, we have a really clear um, chart of, you know, this is what you go through, these are the common findings, these are the rule outs, and these are the steps you can take. But you've got to address your transition first because you're not going to do this to 30 cows a day. Um, so if we go through what are the common issues that we're seeing, um, so if we start with screeners, it's really an energy in, energy out function, I think. So, you know, if we go back to the DRNZ work, which looked at reducing down of cows, reducing mobilising some fat to increase recovery post calving, I reckon that's really cool research and it works really well. The target is being 90% of maintenance energy, which is great. However, when we go out and do energy budgets for people, the message of 90% maintenance feeding has got gone to screw your springers down. Um, and so we often do energy budgets and we get 65% of maintenance energy. So I think there's just a massive underfeeding in the springers, which isn't going on in series. Some of the dairy helps, so that's good. So that, I think they're getting that right. Um, so then with transition monitoring, um, so we, we showed that you know, the performance last year wasn't optimal, the performance this year wasn't optimal. But what we really want to know are the power of the collars, and I think this is what we're trying to put into all our monitoring plans, is the collars can cut down that feedback loop. So instead of telling you at the end of the season, well, your transition wasn't any good, we'll change it for next year. We can have a system like this, so these are the systems that we can set up for Southern Dairy Hub that will say, right, all your cows calved one day ago, two days ago, three days ago, four days ago. This is their rumination loops today, so you can recreate that recovery loop. What it allows you to do is make real-time changes, and you see the response. So you go, right, that didn't work, I'm going to add in some baleage here. Let's fix it. Good, our recovery, recovery is great. And then you know, back it up with your health alerts. But it's that real, you know, cutting down that key time factor in response. So what are the, uh, if we distill it down to five key factors in that transition zone, um, first one is that day zero is critical. Um, so that starts with getting your spring rumination right, so they're going to drop a third to a half on day zero. If it's not high enough for falling, you know, you're going you're gonna to have rock bottoms to get your springers right first. On day zero, offering it plenty of feed, one of the things we found, and this goes through all of these allocations, is 24-hour grazing, so offering one big paddock, 
to once a day feeding doesn't appear to work. Um, so there seems to be a psychological, you know, that these cows that have just calved aren't driven to eat, so you need to psychologically trick them. So when you wind up a reel, they've been conditioned since the day of birth that they're moving to eat. When you lay out some silage, they've been conditioned that they're going to eat. Um, so having motivations to eat seems to make a huge difference. Um, so I was just saying before, one of the things that we've changed in our recommendations is we used to have drop-in paddocks that would leave our fresh recalved cows in for 24 hours and then join them with, them in with the colostrum mob. And what we're finding is consistently those farms are ending up in the, in the red zone because those cows just aren't eating. So we're now actually pushing them straight into the colostrum mob so that they can get motivations to change. Uh, avoiding grazing below 1800 in the colostrum mob, um, which is, you know, been the DRNZ recommendation for years, um, but we often find people really focus on grass quality. We're trying to hit those 1600 covers with colostrum mobs and paying for it in the rates. Uh, third one is just simply allocating enough feed, and so that's usually around farm systems. So this was when we go out, one guy was sending the brakes who had no idea that there were 50 extra cows in there and, and so on. Offering multiple feeding opportunities, just like we talked about before, that psychological advantage. So um, our top farmers end up doing, say, a morning break, an evening break, and feeding out silage in the middle, you know, plus maybe some in sheep feeding if they were doing it. Um, but yeah, multiple feeding opportunities and plenty of live flour so we could fix farms just by increasing live flour. And the cool thing about all of these is the only reason that we have all this data or know about this is that we gave farmers this tool so that they could, you know, see in real time what they were doing and then they'd say, oh, I changed this, I changed this. And then as any good consultant, we stole their ideas, told other people that they didn't, you know, fix their farms. So, you know, all of these ideas have come from farmers in the real world putting them into practice. Um, any questions on the transition before we move on? No. We'll have some more questions at the end of the Okay, so that so that's kind of the transition in a nutshell. So uh, I guess Southern Dairy Hub's probably main issues going on at the moment. If we had to categorise them, would be uh, 24 hour grazing at the moment, just with having so many mobs to manage, multiple breaks has been an issue, but that is something we'll have to see if we can address. Um, because of the you know, wet nature and high pasture cover this year, um, no feeding out of the extra supplement in that period. Um, forgot to mention, we haven't been able to find a grass only feeding system that can reach regulation targets. Um, and yeah, those two, those two are the main ones we'll have to look at for next year. Um, so then, I think it's on about page six or eight, we've got this report, actual report for Southern Dairy Hub that you can see in a um, better, um, better view. But what we created um, for the end of season retro review was this tool here called the Collar Fertility Overview Report, and it, it basically pulls in all the collar data, mating data, so that we can have a real timeline approach of how the farm is performed. So it starts with the top section is how how did they calve down? Did they perform well in terms of days in calf? If we go down to the period calving milestones, it's time to show the report. You know, what was the transition like? Did you perform well in there? Then we go down to pre-make milestones. How did how did your pre-make cycling rates? And then jump up to your um, performance over the mating period. We break it down by section. So how did you go in the first three weeks, second three weeks, third three weeks of mating, and overall in terms of energy rate. Yeah, and because it's benchmark, we're kind of taking the targets out of it. So it's just how are you performing compared to your peers, or what's achievable. And the way I like to think about it is. I like to optimise your performance in each of these zones, knowing that there's, you know, the Madeira and eight pieces of the cake that are going to affect reproduction. So if you, you know, feel like Southern Dairy Carving maybe can hit your targets in Perry Carving milestones, that doesn't mean your year is dead. You know, they've done amazing tools.